uh, something perhaps we've all been thinking about. This was the anniversary of the uh, Supreme Court decision made back in 1973 of Roe v. Wade, which made uh, abortion basically legal uh, throughout the United States. And really on that same day, this is when it took place here in New York this week, is when our governor signed the Reproductive Health Act into law. And uh, on, on the anniversary of that date, the bill that was signed allows for abortions after the 24-week mark, that's any type of, divorce, of abortion uh, without restriction up to that point. And then after 24 weeks, the restrictions are concerning the mother's, it's what is stated, the mother's health. And well, on this bill, it extended to the mother's health and um, whether the unborn baby was viable and uh, out of the womb or so on. Whatever. Um, the point was, this was added to previously up to that point, abortions uh, in New York were supposedly limited to the health of the mother, or I should say the life of the mother. Technically, the Roe v. Wade bill actually included that New York law was a little more restrictive than the uh, Roe v. Wade was allowing there. Um, but the problem is that the idea of health, and we somebody looks back at that and says, well, you have a problem with uh, preserving the life of a mother or and the health of a mother. That the the idea of the when they the term health has been added into. If you ever studied the way this has met, been made up, there was a another bill passed back or a Supreme Court ruling passed back in '73. They actually the ruling came out the very same day of Roe v. Wade. It's called uh, Doe v. Bolton, in which they determined that uh, health could imply n not just the physical health of a mother, but it can imply about anything, emotional stress. It can be included in that. So technically what the bill this passed in New York is really open, this wide open. It also removes the abortion, the idea of abortion from the criminal code completely. Uh, the bill is basically, and it allows, not only that, it allows others besides uh, licensed physicians to actually perform abortions. That would be a, a certified uh, nurse practitioners and uh, midwives, uh, I think there's another category that would be allowed to perform abortions, which there's already a problem of someone has had an abortion, something goes wrong, um, it's already a dangerous situation. But anyway, it's opened it up to that. The bill basically permits abortions up until the day of birth. And it was met, and this is what troubled many, myself included, it was met with a great celebration. I know of those who support abortion and they do it sadly. They say we, we think it's necessary but we, we grieve to do this. And I don't agree with that position but I, I appreciate at least the fact that it grieves them. But this was not met with grief, it was not met with that type of an idea, it was met with a celebration. And um, that's, that's where we're finding ourselves as we're facing this. Um, the bill the, the health of the mother clause basically has removed just about all the restrictions because of how it can be interpreted. That's, that's where we find ourselves. Removing the abortion from the criminal code has put it to the point that if a pregnant woman is attacked and loses her baby because of that, um, it is not, would not be the attacker could not be charged with the murder of the, of the unborn baby. Um, that's, that's taken out of the criminal code at this point. The main justification for the bill is the idea that it enhances women's rights. That's what the celebration supposedly was about. I, I kind of wonder, is somebody forgetting that 50% of the babies that are boarded are females? Uh, their rights are somewhat been stripped away, I would think, if you're going to look at it that way. But if a woman has a baby, and there was one in the news not too long ago, that she had a baby and abandoned the baby after the baby was born. She abandoned it. And um, the baby was found, and they were able to uh, resuscitate the, the infant. So she's not charged with murder, but she is charged with attempted murder. She had, uh, this was the day after the baby was born. According to this law now, if she had, that had taken place, she had an abortion the day before, she would have been totally, uh, had no fear of persecution or prosecution. Now, I, I'm talking about the blueprints of what God says. You probably have guessed that I'm very pro-life in position, and 
I really think as we study the Word of God, you're going to come up with a pro-life position. If you're not that position, I'm not your enemy, but I am going to try to show you what God says. And I want us to approach it in that way. What is the blueprint? What does God say about this? Why are so many of us upset about these developments? And we know things have been taking place. And I think the main reason is this, because we simply believe that life is precious. I want to start today with really understanding the issue. Let's, let's look at the issue. What's really taking place here? What are we looking at? And, you know, because you can hear the arguments and, and uh, someone say, well, that sounds good. I understand how someone could be in that situation. But let's, let's, let's look at some type of a standard here. What does God say about it? What does the blueprint from the architect say about it? Well, in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 27, we'll start there. By the way, if you did receive a bulletin today, you have on the back of that bulletin, you have a really nifty place to take notes if you'd like to do that. You also, I'm encouraging you, if you are using the, your digital Bible, you're, you're on the, if you're using the version form, you're on the events page there. There are places you can add. I'm encouraging you to add your thoughts to this, to keep your, these things in your mind as well. There might be something that comes to your mind. Maybe there's a verse, maybe there's a question you have. And if you're like me, you can have a question at the beginning of the service and before the service is over, you will have forgotten the question if you didn't write it down. So I encourage you to write those things down as well. And let's make it a learning process as well as a time of really, as we get into God's word, see what God has for us. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, laying groundwork here. This is, now obviously, I'm approaching this from a biblical standpoint. Some would say, well, you sound like you're getting political here. I, I think what's happened is that our legislators have, have gotten into the, into the realms of what the scripture says. And instead of us becoming political, this is very much intertwined with what God says in his word. So I don't only have a right, I have a responsibility to expose what I really believe the Bible is teaching about this. This is what God says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Very basic statement. That's the idea of creation. Uh, by the way, this makes a lot of difference. If, you are, if you're an evolutionist, I doubt if you're going to be faithfully uh, in, in church and so on anyway, but if you have totally dismissed the fact of the existence of God, if you're an atheist and have embraced evolution, or even as a Christian, if you embraced evolution, this might make a little difference. And I'm telling you, this is a starting point. Either God has created us or he has not. And according to the word of God, he has. So that's our starting point. I believe he's the architect. That's where the blueprint starts out. Human beings have been created in the image of God. That does not mean that God looks like us in the physical form. To be created in the likeness of God means that we bear his image in a sense. And with it, there's a value. And it's important to understand that. There's a value beyond the unique characteristics or our attributes, our individual attributes. You are not valuable just because of what you can do. Or because of how you contribute to society. You are valuable because God made you. And if we can grasp that. An infant in the womb is not valuable because it is able to do anything. It is valuable because it has been created by God. That's the beginning of understanding this. We've been created in the likeness of God. Nothing else, by the way, in God's, in God's creation has that distinction has that privileged status. That's only for humankind. No one else, no other creature has been created in the image of God. This is not something being created in the image of God. There's nothing tangible that we can see, taste, or feel. But being created in His image establishes our significance. It establishes our worth. At the highest level, you are valuable. Not because of what you can contribute to this life. Although uh, you no doubt have some tremendous abilities. That's not why you're valuable. That's not why God has put worth upon you. You're not valuable because of your good looks. You're not valuable because of your prestige. You're not valuable because of your athletic abilities. You're not valuable because of your musical abilities. You are valuable because God made you. And if we could grasp that. Every living human being is valuable because of that. That's where our significance is. Listen to what the scripture, you might need to write this down if you don't have it uh, written out in your notes there. Psalm 139 verses 13 and 14. Listen to these words. 
You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. That baby in the mother's womb, even when they're so tiny, we, we can barely see them. Even at the moment of conception, is already being intricately formed. It is valuable. Not because it, at that point, can exist outside the mother's womb, because it cannot. It is valuable, not because it can necessarily do anything great. It is valuable, once again, because it is created in the image. That little child is created in the image of God. That gives it its value and its worth. That makes the difference. It's so much, so much of a difference. Humans are breathtaking creatures because we're embodying the touch of the Creator Himself. That's the wonder of human life. You've held a newborn baby. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You stand there looking at that beautiful, and they may be little and tiny, and everybody thinks that their babies are beautiful. Uh, some of them, they're, I mean, they're all little, and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're scrunched up faces, and, and they look like their daddy, and so bless their hearts, okay? So, but the thing is, that's a beautiful creation, and you're seeing that something that God has brought into being. Contrary to the popular idea of our culture, our value is not determined on our ethnic background. Our value is not determined according to the race, which by the way is an evolutionary term because we are one race. It's called the human race, just so you know that. But people look at the value according to the color of someone's skin or to their gender. You're not valuable because of your age of your abilities, or your location, whether in your mother's womb or whether you're in a nursing home someplace, you are valuable because God has made you. Your divine membership in the human, human family sets us apart as being sacred. Life is sacred. We must grasp that. And men and women and children, including the unborn, the pre-born children in the womb, should be respected regardless of their mental capacity, their physical ability, or their social position. That should be the position of everyone who believes and loves the architect and the blueprint of God's Word, because that's what it teaches. concept of human dignity comes from the idea of the sanctity of human life. Humans are made in God's image. We hold a distinctive status that sets us apart. I know that our world has got to the point because of the idea that we are nothing more than an evolutionary accident. And so our value is placed as equal status with the animals. Now, if there's anyone who has a soft spot for animals, it is me. I love animals. I have, I have pets. We, uh, uh, you know, I really... I get into raising animals. It gets me angry to see people abuse animals. I get that. And I think that the animal abuse is wrong, but that's, they're not created image of God. There's a respect of life. By the way, we should have towards all of life. By the way, I'm not a vegetarian, just so you don't get the wrong idea here. I believe God has created animals for different purposes. But my point is this. We have looked at, and so much in our society, we get concerned over protecting of a, of a species of animals. And, and we put our effort into that, and yet we're forgetting the dignity of human life and are willing to sacrifice it on the altar of expediency and the altar of convenience. And we missed the whole point. Our value is not based on our ability to care for ourselves or our competence to complete a task. Dignity is not a concept that can be forfeited. You have dignity because you are a human being. Instead of providing a compassionate response to those who are disabled who face the terminal illness, many would like to kind of shove them out of the picture. We must never forget that God is ultimately sovereign over the affairs of our lives, and that includes our frailty and our infirmity. I would suggest that we let God be the author of life because that's who He is and not try to be God's ourselves and take it upon us to decide when someone should live and when someone should die. 
God's blueprint for respecting lives begins, by the way, with your respecting your own value, recognizing who you are, and then you can see others as lives as being sacred and important too. Do you embrace your worth and significance? I mean, sometimes we can really get down on ourselves. I don't have the abilities. I don't have the talent that someone else does. I'm worthless. I'm old. I'm frail. I can't really do anything. You are still one who's been created in the image of God. And by the way, whether you know it or not, you have a purpose in this life. And God has a plan for you. And you can realize that. And we should respect the dignity of everyone all the way from the pre-born to those who are way, way past the ability to live a, a life and their own abilities and so on. That's the value of human life all the way down. And the idea of assisted suicide and euthanasia, those are other points that we could get into, but all of them should be thrown out when we understand the value of human life. As we're looking at this world through God's eyes, not through human uh, humanistic ideology that puts God out of the picture, but looking at this life through in this world through God's eyes. Look beyond someone's physical appearance of ability. Can you look at them and see the image of God in them? Because it's there. God has created them. We value human life. We'll be willing to speak out for those who cannot speak for themselves. Proverbs 31, verse number 8. I would suggest you underline this. That you highlight it. You do something. Never forget this principle. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. We have responsibility when we see that taking place. One biblical principle of justice is this, that the more knowledge we have that our action is wrong, the more guilty we are and the more deserving of punishment. Many of us look back at the years leading up to World War II and wonder what in the world was going on in Germany. What in the world? Why did people allow the atrocities that took place there? As some five, six million Jewish people put to death, along with another five or six million others, many because they had helped the Jewish people. Those who were in disfavor with the Nazis, why was that allowed? Did anyone know what was going on? And I'm telling you today that we need to look at what's happening in our own, in our own sphere, in our own part of the world. Truth is, we know that abortion is killing children. That, that's, that's no longer a, a discussion. To be honest. I mean, it's beyond the idea of someone scientifically saying, well, we're not quite sure where that should be considered taking a life because there's a heart beating. Even before the heart is beating, the life is already there. But the point is, in most cases, the, the abortion is taking place, I would say probably, at least abortions that are done uh, besides the chemical abortions, most of them are going to be done when the heart is already beating. But the point is, there's no question a life is stopped. And you can talk about, well, there's not really life until it emerges from the womb. Does that make sense? We know that babies can be born weeks premature. I mean, and we don't look at them as being not human until they reach the, the time that they would have been born. I mean, no one does that. We know it's killing children. We know that. Even abortionists will admit they know they're killing children. To hide behind the rhetoric that that fetus has no rights until he or she emerges from the wounds wrong in so many ways. But the defense for abortion is this. It's held up as a matter of justice for women. I'm trying to be compassionate here because I know there are issues that people face. It's held that it would be a greater evil to deny a woman the equal right of reproductive freedom. That's what the bill in New York's all about. That means that women should be no more encumbered by the consequences of an unplanned pregnancy than men would be. So that equal freedom from that burden of bearing unwanted children is the basis. For, you remember a few years ago, President Obama referred to that again and again in public when he talked about the equal rights for women. We know what that means. But we also know that it's killing children. 38 states. And I'll tell you why we know it's killing children. 38 states treat killing an unborn child as a homicide. If a child is killed, whether it's a car accident, uh, you caused it, or whatever, uh, uh, it's going to be uh, neglected homicide, whatever that would be, or uh, you have caused someone, uh, attack someone, whatever, they consider killing that 
unborn baby as a homicide. It's illegal to take the life of an unborn if the mother wants the baby. But in our country, it's legal to take the life of the unborn if she doesn't. We know it's killing a child. In the first case, the law treats the fetus as a human with rights. The second case, the law treats the fetus as non-human with no rights. We get a whole thing about the image of God. Humanness is defined by the desire and the will of the powerful. And that's not any different than what took place in Nazi Germany, nor what took place in race-based slavery. Those who are powerful, those who could manipulate, were the ones who could say who could live or who was a person or not. We know we're killing babies. Here's another reason. Doctors can perform fetal surgery. They can do surgery on infants within the womb. They're treating them like people because they are. They know that they're human. Being small does not disqualify personhood. No matter how small they might be, being small does not disqualify you from personhood. We've talked about the fact that we're in the image of God. Not having developed reasoning power does not disqualify personhood. That infant in the womb may not be able to, to think in the ways that someone who is older and is, has developed can. And in fact, there are those who perhaps cannot, even as they have grown and physically may not have the abilities to reason, but that does not make them less human. They still have, are in the, in the image of God. Being in a womb does not disqualify human personhood. They're just in a different location. We know the principle of justice, that when two legitimate rights conflict, the right that protects the higher value should prevail. If I'm driving down the road and I say I feel like I should have the right to drive 100 miles an hour, I love doing that. I like to get in and let the car just go. And the policeman pulls me over. He has the right to give me a ticket. And I can say, well, you're, you're, you're violating my right. To go this speed, that law is a violation of my right. And his point is, but the problem is this. You're going 100 miles an hour is a great danger, not only to yourself, but to other people on the road. And so the rights of those people to stay alive is a lot bigger than your right to want to go 100 miles an hour. That's how we look at that. No one has a problem with understanding that. And I would say today that staying alive and an infant staying alive is much more precious right and much more basic than someone not wanting to be pregnant. Now, I'm not trying to be harsh to those who are struggling with pregnancies. But what I'm saying, if you're going to look at the rights and where they should be, we need to look at what, how God looks at it and how he looks at the idea of human worth. Proverbs 24, verses 11 and 12. Wow, this scripture can really... Really grab you, slap you across the face as you listen to it. Listen to this. Rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die. Save them as they stagger to their death. Don't excuse yourself by saying, look, we didn't know. For God understands all hearts and he sees you. And he who guards your soul knows you well. He knows you knew. He will repay all people as their actions deserve need to understand the issues. That's the beginning point. It's not just a political decision that's made here. This is something that has to do with the very fabric of humanity. But let's approach the issue with compassion. I've begun really in the point of approaching with the compassion towards the unborn. And I think there should be a compassion towards those who are elderly and frail. There should, there's a compassion that's needed in our lives. That's important. But I don't think the compassion should end there. There are those who are caught up in a situation where they're considering abortion. I believe they need our compassion. Let me explain that. I love the statement I found by a man named Jamel Williams. It says this, Law change through politics is good, but heart change through the gospel is better. I love that statement. That's one thing, and, we, and sometimes we'll get involved and say we need to change the laws here and protect the unborn. And I, I believe that's, I think it's important, but not nearly as important as the heart changes that are needed. 
There's a reason that people are going that direction in their life. One criticism of pro-lifers often made by the pro-abortion crowd is that all we do is judge those who have had abortions or are having abortions and never offer an alternative. And so they look at us as just people who protest around abortion clinics and say mean things to them and that type of thing. And I'm sure that sometimes that takes place. That's not, that's not necessarily the rule of what happens, but that's the picture that's portrayed. But I'm telling you, that's an unfair assessment because many pro-lifers have spent a great deal of money and offer a great deal of effort to reach out to those who are considering having an abortion. And there are organizations, and I'm encouraging you and I'm encouraging us as a church to get involved in these things in a greater way. There's a, the CareNet uh, organization, My Choice. There's actually a My Choice Pregnancy Center in Middletown. They are funded and staffed by Christians they do not get government funding. They are funded and they try to make a difference. And they try to give counseling to those who are considering abortion. And they have a, an ultrasound that's available. They uh, will help uh, young ladies who are uh, trying to raise their children and so on. They, uh, there's different things they try to do to reach out. They try to offer adoption services and all these types of things. So they are reaching out. And that's, that's what we should do. There are people who find themselves that are struggling uh, maybe different situations they found themselves in. They don't know what to do. They are they go down to Planned Parenthood and are told, well, one of the best things you can do is have an abortion. It's easy. It's 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 simple and it takes care of all your problems. And that's what they're hearing. So they need to have someone who can give them the alternative. Churches need to spread a culture of life across our nation by equipping men and women of our churches to offer that type of compassion, hope, and help. Thousands of women find themselves pregnant. And they have no one to turn to. We ought to be there so they can turn to us. Others may be experiencing difficulties in their pregnancies. They've been told that the baby is probably going to be severely handicapped and they don't know how to handle that. And we ought to be compassionate and reach out and, and try to be consoling and helpful in any way we can do. We need to be salt and light in our communities and reach out. Thousands of women who have had abortions today are struggling with the decision they made. There's nothing that they cannot make that decision. And they are struggling. And some of them go through a tremendous depression because of that. And we need to be reaching out to them, showing them that they can have forgiveness and healing through Jesus Christ. There's a great deal of things that we can do to reach out with compassion. It's not just a matter of being angry because there are abortion laws being uh, loosened up. There ought to be the idea of compassion towards those who are struggling. Listen to how Jesus responded to a world that basically had turned their back on him. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, when he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I'm telling you today, that's the world we live in. There's a lot of confused and helpless people because they've rejected, whether they realize it or not, they basically rejected the architect and the blueprint on how to live. And they've gone their own way. That's been the popular way of their culture. And that's what they have bought into. And they're, they're going through this life struggling and they need someone to have compassion upon them. Most people will have to experience our compassion before they listen to our message. That's something to think about. The scripture says us this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So our responsibility of Christians is to know what the issue is. I'm afraid a lot of Christians do not. They haven't taken the time to really think it through. We ought to know what the issue is, but and in response, it ought to be a response of compassion. This world needs Jesus, desperately needs him. The reason that the world lives like that is because they don't have him. They don't have the work of the Holy Spirit within their hearts. They need him. We need to have compassion towards the lost world around us. Let me say this then. We need to approach the issue with prayer. That's in God's blueprint. It's obvious that God's people should be praying about the situation we find our nation in today. 
Over 61 million babies have been aborted since Roe v. Wade took place in 1973. That's a lot of babies. 61 million. Over 61 million. Our nation's turned its back on God in so many ways. Our elected officials continue to support policies which defy the God of heaven. Not just an abortion, all different types of things that are totally contrary to what God has told us and God's instructions for us. Someone has said, if God does not, ju does not send judgment to America, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. As God's people, we are called to pray. The verse in 2 Chronicles 7.14, oft used, probably not too often really taken seriously, but it is something we ought to really seriously look at today. God says to ancient Israel, and it applies to us as well. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Revival does not start with non-believers. It starts with God's people. It starts with us recognizing our sin, our own sin. I don't know what God has in mind for our country. But I do know what I'm supposed to be doing right now. I'm supposed to be praying. Our governor and many of the legislators this week made a big deal of celebrating the decision that saddens so many of us. It's like a finger in our eye, so to speak. The governor obviously does not live in regards to God's instruction concerning his own personal morals. We're pretty knowledgeable of that. He's also made in different statements. He said that pro-lifers, along with others, have no place in this state, in the state of New York. But I'm not going to begin the chant of, he's not my governor, because he is. He is my governor. I ought to respect him because of who he is. And I ought to, not just ought to, but I am required, I am obligated, I am commanded by Scripture to pray for Governor Cuomo and anybody else who's in authority. And not to pray for his demise. Some of you say, oh yeah, I can pray for this guy. I pray that he'll fall and break his leg. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm praying. We should be praying for his salvation. I remember a man in the Scripture, his name was Saul of Tarsus. You remember reading about him? There was a point that the early Christians were scared to death of this guy because he was coming after them and all those he could find, he threw them into prison and was trying to have them put to death and everything else. There was some, there was some pretty serious praying going on. And one day this Saul of Tarsus, this man who delighted in putting Christians to death, was on the road to Damascus and he met Jesus. And that changed the rest of his life and he became the great the great apostle to the Gentiles, led many, many thousands of people to Christ in his last in lifetime. Of course, millions and millions have come to Christ because of his influence. God can change anyone. God can change our elected officials. Whether they will respond to the gospel or not is not my responsibility. That's God's. And that is, of course, the choice that they have to make. But we are to pray. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 2, those first four verses. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings, and underline this, highlight it, do something, pay attention to this statement, and all who are in authority. We like to complain about those who are in authority, but we don't pray to, uh, for them very often. Whether they're Christian or non-Christian makes no difference. We're to pray for them. The heart of kings is in the hand of God. Don't ever forget that. We are to pray for all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Look at the next phrase. Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. I'm not going to pray for my governor to, uh, for his demise. I'm going to pray for his salvation. Because God loves him and sent his son to die for him like he has everyone else. And that's of responsibility. Seriously, I, since I've been in preparation of this message, and God's got a hold of my heart, I've been praying for Governor Cuomo every day, two, three, four, five times. God keeps bringing this to my mind. I don't know if that would impress him or not, but I must tell him if he happens to be listening to this, Governor, I'm praying for you that you come to know Jesus. 
I'm not saying that in a derogatory way, trying to act like I'm better than, than he is, but he needs to have Christ in his life like everyone else needs. He's been created in the image of God as well. And I need to be praying for him. We should be praying for our leaders. And we, we talk about it. We, every once in a while we might think about it, but I think we rarely do. You and I have a choice to make. We can ignore God's blueprint for the sanctity of life and the fabric of our nation. We can humbly repent of our sins and cry out for God's mercy. Responsibility, really, it comes to us. We can look at the world which we feel like is making some really bad decisions, but they're not the ones who have been called upon to pray to God because they're not his people. They're not a follower of Christ. It's our responsibility to get on our knees, to confess our sin, to confess our, uh, our, our lack of, of care and concern for others around us, perhaps, to confess our apathy, Confess whatever it is is keeping us, our lack of, of, of concern for, for the souls of, of, of others around us. It's our, our responsibility to fall on our knees and confess our sin to God. And he's promised, he's promised to hear our prayers. Whether the United States will ever be turned around and, and I don't know what would take place, but I do know that God hears and answers prayer. And I do know what I'm supposed to do. I'm asking you today, what? will you do? Are you going to be willing to live by the blueprint of the architect, which work, by the way? Or are you going to ignore them? Or are we going to just dig a hole, you know, the foxhole someplace, say, well, this world's going to hell in a handbasket. I guess I just hide here till Jesus comes. That is not what God has called us to do. He has called us to be salt and light. And the salt and light do no good hiding in the trenches someplace, hiding in the foxholes. To be effective, we need to be out with compassion, sharing what God has done and what he can do in the lives of others, and praying for those around us, and specifically praying for those who are in authority. What will you do with it? Let me ask you a question. Have you realized the importance of who you are? That's where it starts. God has created you for a specific purpose. He loves you. He sent his son to die for you. Have you come to that point of recognizing what God has done in your life? Have you recognized him as your Lord and your Savior? That's a place to start. You are made, you've been created in the image of God. Would you trust him if you've never done that? Would you trust him to be your Lord and Savior? those who put their faith in Christ, would you be willing to follow and to live your life according to God's blueprint? God has a plan. It works. Would you be one who would step out in compassion towards a lost world around us? Instead of condemning, showing compassion. Being those who love others enough to tell them the truth but to show them the solution through Jesus Christ. That's God's plan for us. Let's be a church that lives like that. Father, I'm asking for your blessings. We need your guidance. We live in a world that's darkened by the effects of sin, but we also know that you're the great, awesome God who can do such a great and awesome things in our lives as we let you have control. I pray for the leaders of our country. I pray for our governor and the legislators. Even though I'm saddened at the decisions that have been made, Lord, I lift them up before you. I pray, first of all, that they'd come to know you as Savior. I pray that you would get a hold of their hearts and their minds in such a way that they, they would begin to see things in, through your eyes. But, Lord, we just lift that up before you. Help us to be a people that do what you have for us to do. And first of all, that's to pray for others around us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the blueprint you've given to us on how to live. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.